John chapter 11, the first 15 verses. Let me put it on the screen for you. I forget oftentimes to do that. There you go. So you can follow with us if you do not have a Bible. And the word of the Lord reads today from the King James text. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany. The town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had there, heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still, in the same place where he was. <clears throat> then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after he, <clears throat> and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Final verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Hallelujah. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, I'm going to speak to us today for a while on the topic, No Loss of Love. Father, we love you, Lord, and once again, God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to come into the house of God while the singing of the hymns and the worship is an important part of our function in this place. The most important, the most valuable part of any church service is the preaching of the Word of God. And it is not because the preacher is gifted or special or has some ability in and of himself, but it is because the Word of God is alive. And with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the Word of God touches our hearts, touches our spirits, our minds, and brings to life all that it touches. I ask God today, my weary body, my struggling frame, touch it with your divine power this hour. For Lord, I desire to preach the word of God with conviction. I desire God to preach it with passion. I desire, Lord, today to preach it as I feel it and as I believe it. Lord, that the people of God might receive it not only in their hearing, but in their heart. Prepare our hearts, everyone in this building, everyone on the internet, so that we might not only hear the words that are spoken, but we might receive 
the message from heaven that you would desire to impart to us at this hour that our faith might grow and prosper even as we hear the words of life. We ask it all in that blessed, wonderful, sacred name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this afternoon. Glory to God. Amen. No loss of love. I've heard the story of Lazarus preached on <laughs> only God knows how many times in my lifetime. Having been raised in the church, I probably have heard this uh, passage, this story preached on, I dare say dozens, if not even, maybe even a hundred times or better. And, you know, the emphasis is usually on the miracle of Lazarus' resurrection, which occurs later in the story. But today, God has given me a message that deals with an aspect of this story that I must tell you, I don't believe I've ever heard a preacher talk about this particular aspect <clears throat> of this story. You know, sometimes you'll hear people talk about a parting of the ways between parties. You know, you may hear it talked about George Steinbrenner parting with a uh, manager of his team. And I'm trying to think of who some of the managers of his teams were. And, of course, my brain is wanting to go, so I can't, <laughs> can't quite think of the name. But, you know, when that manager would leave, the commentator would say, well, there was no loss of love between them. Meaning what? Meaning, when they parted company, neither one of them was heartbroken over their parting company. There was really no love between them to start with. So when one leaves the scene, you know, sometimes somebody will die, and they'll say, well, you know, his mother-in-law died, and there was no love lost between he and his mother-in-law, right? You follow what I'm saying? Because there was no love there to begin with. They weren't crazy about one another to start with. And the enemy loves when trials and tribulations and sickness comes against our body. The enemy loves to come against our minds as children of God and try to convince us that God is angry with us. That the Lord doesn't love us. That there's the loss of love. Right, Lisa? You ever experienced that? You ever had the devil come against your mind and say, the reason you're going through this is because God is angry with you. And of course, you know, like Job's comforters, we talked about Job last week. Like Job's comforters, I think it was last week. Uh, <laughs> like Job's comforters, you know, they come along and people have all kinds of theories as to why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. And oftentimes they'll say, well, you know, you must be doing something wrong for the Lord to be allowing this to happen to you. I'm going to tell you, preachers are not immune from this kind of attack from the enemy. I'm going to tell you right now, I told you earlier today, I had an extremely difficult week this week. One day in particular, Lisa, the enemy come against my mind, and it was like, you know, the devil was just filling my head with thoughts, you're going to die, and it's because God just quit on you, the Lord just give up on you, you know, his love is worn out, and you're just not good enough, and you're just not doing the job he's called you well enough to do, and you know, every thought, Johnny was coming against my head, Oh my God, it was enough to make you want to blow your own brains out. It really was. But I prayed and I said, God, I need your help, Lord. I said, I, I know these thoughts don't originate in heaven. I know these thoughts don't line up with the word of God. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you believe nothing that don't line up with the word of God. If a thought comes into your heaven, the word of God said, bringing into captivity every thought. To the obedience of Christ. 
That's the enemy. When the enemy comes against your mind, you got to put that thought in a cage. Hallelujah. And you know what that cage is? That cage is the Word of God. You surround that evil, demonic thought with what the Word of God says. And you say, now listen, thought, I've got news for you. God loves me. God cares about me. God is looking out for me. All things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to your purpose. So you just quit trying to haunt me with all this negativity. You quit trying to haunt me with all this depression and all this stuff. You bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. How do you do that? You wrap the word of God around every thought. And if that thought doesn't match up with the word of God, then put it in a box, put it in a cage, put it in a coffin and bury it. Hallelujah. It's amazing in our story today how much emphasis is placed on the love that the Lord had for the main characters in this tale. We're told that the Lord loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus in verse number five. I have to look real careful. I'm about to tell you verse eight. It's verse five. <laughs> Put these back on. Verse 5 tells us, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So the three primary figures in this story, we are told plainly that the Lord loved them. Huh, interesting. But then as we read on in the story, we read in verse 3, for instance, that when Lazarus was sick, verse 3 said, Therefore his sisters, Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, sent unto him, meaning Jesus, saying, Lord, listen, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. A lot of emphasis on love between the Lord and these three people, isn't there? Even when Mary and Martha sent for the Lord, they reminded him, hey, you love this guy. This guy you love is sick. I remember years ago in Riverside Church of God, there was an older man in the church. Uh, he had a wonderful wife and a, a he was in his 70s, and Brother Sensabaugh took to me. When I came from Texas, uh, Connecticut, and I came to Texas as a teenager, Brother Freeman Sensabaugh took to me. There was something about me. He never had a son. When he died, his wife told me, she said, you were always the son he wanted that he never had. He had five daughters, I believe it was. Poor guy couldn't pop out a girl, a boy, no matter how hard he tried. And he always wanted a son. Well, when I came down from Connecticut, Brother Sensible just fell in love with me. And I, in turn, fell in love with him. Now, I don't mean that, obviously, in any kind of a strange way. But I mean, you know, uh, he became sort of a, a product of... A, 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 surrogate dad and I became a surrogate son and he was so sweet to me and so kind to me and uh, I loved him so much and he loved me so much and I'll never forget when I heard that brother Sensible was in the hospital and that he was not expected to live and someone came to me and said Chuck you know brother Sensible that you love so much? Well, he's in the hospital. You see, there's an emphasis on that relationship that I had with him. Because everybody knew that relationship was there. Everybody knew that he had a special place in my heart. And I had a special place in his heart. And when they told me of his condition and what was happening with him, Bill, you know, it was with that reminder. This is Brother Sensible that you love so dearly. He's in the hospital. Well, when they came to Jesus to tell him about Lazarus, 
They reminded the Lord, hey, Mary and Martha told us to tell you that that Lazarus that you love, he's sick. He's very, very sick. Now, why do you suppose Mary and Martha had the messenger to remind the Lord that Lazarus was somebody that he loved? Why do you suppose they did that? Could it have been in hopes that reminding him of that love and that special relationship, that it might just put wings on Jesus' feet and get him to hustle and get him to move a little bit quicker. In other words, Lord, we're reminding you about how much you love him so you'll really move and get here as fast as you can get here. You know what I'm saying? When you remind me of Brother Sensible is in the hospital, you know the man that you really love, that immediately made me want to get up and go and go see him as quickly as I could go see him. You see, that reminder of that love he had for Lazarus was meant to encourage the Lord to quickly get to him. And what did the Lord do? What does the story tell us today? It tells us that the Lord Instead of immediately rising and making his way to the bedside of sick Lazarus, we are told instead that he tarried for days. He took his time. He didn't hurry. He didn't rush. He didn't make, you know, quick steps to get to Lazarus. He took his dear old sweet time. And then after a couple of days, he finally turned to his disciples and said, Okay, now we need to make the journey back into Judea. Now we need to get to where Lazarus is. Because Lazarus is asleep. Well, Lord, if he's sleeping, we need to just leave him alone. Like Brother Charles, you know, when he don't feel well and he's tired, if he's sleeping, the last thing in the world we need to do is wake him up. The Lord said, well, that's the whole purpose I'm going is to wake him up. Well, the Lord, if he's ill and he's sleeping, then we ought to leave him be. Finally, the Lord looks at him and says, uh, y'all don't understand. When I tell you he's sleeping, I'm talking in divine terms he's sleeping. In human terms, he is dead. You see, the way God sees things, oh, hallelujah, and the way you see things are not the same. Glory to God. Your dilemma, your trouble, your trial, your sickness, your disease. Honey, God doesn't see them the same way you see them. The Lord sees Lazarus as merely sleeping. But human beings saw Lazarus as dead. Oh, I'm glad when God sees my dilemma, he doesn't see that old thing is dead. He just sees it as sleeping. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad God sees things from a divine perspective. I'm glad God sees things from a different place. <coughs> and I'm glad God has the ability to wake up those who are sleeping, Amen. even though in this life we would call them dead. He has the ability to raise the dead. The Lord said, there's a reason why I'm delaying my trip to see Lazarus. I'm not delaying without purpose. I've got news for you today, folks. When God doesn't answer your prayer today or tomorrow or the next day or the next day, understand, oh, hallelujah, listen to me, understand. Just like what he said to his disciples, he says, there's a reason I'm waiting. There's a benefit in this for you. Did you hear what I said, children? There is a benefit in this for you. He said, for your benefit, I'm waiting. I could have gone right away, but Lisa, I'm not going right away. Because if I go right away, you're not going to benefit in the same way that you're going to benefit if I wait. You see, it's hard for us when we're going through sickness. Listen, this preacher knows what he's talking about, trust me. It's hard for us when we're going through sickness. It's hard for us when we're going through trials. It's hard for us when we're being tempted. It's hard for us when we're going through uh, struggles to understand why God seems 
to not be hearing our prayer. We sent a messenger. We sent someone to get the Lord, but why didn't he come immediately? Lisa, why didn't God answer my prayer the day that I first prayed? Why is he waiting? What's taking him so long? You ever prayed for something? You ever been in a hot spot and you pray and you pray and say, Lord, I need you to help me get out of this. I need you to touch my body. I need you to touch my mind. I need you to give me strength. I need you to give me renewal. I need you to restore me. God, where are you, Lord? Where are you? Why aren't you rushing to get here? And all the while, the Lord is saying, Oh, I'm happy to be waiting. I'm glad I'm waiting because when this is all said and done, you're going to benefit from this experience in a way that you can't even imagine. Now, we can't see that when everything's happening. You don't see that. Trust me, the preacher don't see that when he laying around the house all day feeling like he'd been beat up by a bear. No, he don't see what God's doing. But I've learned to trust him and to know if he doesn't rush to my bedside, he'll still be God when he gets there. Hallelujah. He'll still be able to do what needs to be done whenever he arrives. I don't need God to be in a hurry. He Because God is God when you're sick. God is God when you're dead. God is God when you need him to be God. And he'll get there when the time is right. Hallelujah! Glory to God! When I was laying in my hospital bed in 2000, I'd been praying, Johnny, for a year, year and a half for God to heal me. I had, you know, my, my digestive system was all messed up. Uh, food ran through me faster than I could eat it. I'm trying to say it nicely. I was having a devil of a time. For almost a year and a half, Lisa, I was having a terrible, terrible, terrible time. I was losing weight left and right. I was getting weak. It was hard for me to function. Food was not digested. I got news for you, honey. When food don't digest properly, just about everything in your system goes out of whack, including your thought processes. You know, you can't think straight. You can't function. I've been through some stuff in my life, I'm going to tell you. And I began to pray when it first, when that illness first began to manifest itself. I began to pray, Lord, heal me. God, I need you to heal me. I need you to heal me. And almost a year and a half went by. And guess what? God never touched me, never healed me. I struggled, I struggled, I struggled. Johnny, there were times I took a train from New York where I was living to Connecticut where my family was. And... When I got off the train, my, my, uh, my family member wasn't there to meet me, to drive me to my grandmother's house, so I figured I'll walk to my grandmother's. It's a couple miles. Long story short, before I could get to the house, things were happening that I could not stop. I mean, I went through, at least I went through some rough stuff, some ugly stuff. I, if you'd asked me, I'd have much preferred not to go through all that. Finally, in 2000, the summer of 2000, y'all know the story. I won't go through it all. I wound up three hospitalizations, two for a week, one for two weeks. Finally, I wound up in, in Yale Haven Hospital in August of 2000. And next thing you know, I'm on life support. I'm nearly a month on life support. Uh, I had a parasite in my digestive system that was killing me. Then, on top of that, I wound up with pneumonia. And the pneumonia was in both lungs. And the doctor told me before I went unconscious, he said, I don't even know how you're able to talk to me right now. He said, your x-ray shows that your lungs are so full of fluid. I don't even know how you're able to talk to me right now. To be honest, you should be dead. He said, I don't know if we're going to be able to save you. And that was about the last words I heard because next thing you know, I was unconscious. I was out of it. And I woke up with tubes down my throat and up my nose. And I was hooked up to everything. And you got that little machine. <laughs> helping you breathe. You know, I'm seeing the ceiling is on fire. I'm seeing bugs crawling out of the light fixtures. I'm having all kinds of you know, visions and the drugs are just 
making me loopy and crazy and you know and it was a horrifying horrifying experience the whole experience was so horrific that to be honest with you folks to this day I have some PTSD related to that hospitalization when I first come out of the hospital Lisa I couldn't even watch a film that portrayed somebody on life support if I was watching TV and they showed somebody, you know, with tubes up their nose in the hospital and on life support, I literally had to change the channel as fast as I could because it, when it first happened, uh, Bill, I had so much anxiety in me that immediately it would just, it, it, I can't even explain the feeling it put through me, okay? Long story short, God showed up. Oh, he didn't show up when I was sick. He showed up when I was dying. He didn't show up when I first started dying. He showed up, brother, when the doctor said there was no hope in the world that I'd live. He showed up at the last possible minute. He waited until the last possible second. He waited until every doctor and every scientist and every expert had signed me off and told my family to lay out a suit and get ready to bury me. And then God showed up. Got news for you. He was still God. Hallelujah. He was still able to do what needed to be done, Johnny. It didn't matter to God that I was so far gone. It didn't matter to God that I was at death's door. No, he was still God. He was still able to raise me up. But when he did, he gave me a testimony and a miracle that very few people have ever experienced in their lifetime. And I'm able now to understand when I go into a hospital room, Lisa, and I see somebody on life support, I'm able to understand what they're going through. I'm going to tell you something. You cannot know what people go through with certain things until you have to go through those things for yourself. I told Tommy the other day, I said, well, I guess the Lord's educating me. Because you never know what it feels like to have a doctor look at you and say, you've got cancer. And if we don't treat you and treat you fast and treat you quick and treat you for the next year or two, you will die probably within the year. You don't know what that feels like. You don't know how that plays with your head. You don't know how the enemy comes against a person's mind that experiences the C word until you've had to sit across from the doctor and have him use that word on you. Let me tell you right now, I never knew. I can be honest with you. I had no idea what it felt like. I do now. I understand it now. Wonder sometimes, Lord, why aren't you hurrying up? I thought you loved me. Lord, if you love me, you're going to hurry. If you love you're going to take care of this right away. If you love me, Lord, you're not going to let me struggle. You're not going to let me suffer. Don't we love to put conditions on love? How many times have you gone through something or experienced something and somebody in your life, whether it be your mother, your dad, your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife, and they don't quite respond as quickly as you would like for them to have responded. And you'll turn and say, if you loved me, if you loved me, you would. I kind of pull that on Tommy once in a while when I'm in the mood for a diet, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> If you love me, you get up and give me a diet, Dr. Pepper, because you know I don't feel good. You know I'm very exhausted and stuff. If you really love me, you ever you ever done that or am I alone? No. <laughs> when the Lord finally showed up, where Lazarus had lived, his sister comes out to him and says, Oh, if only you'd have gotten here sooner, things would be different. What was she saying? Lord, if you loved him like you're supposed to have loved him, you'd have got here a whole lot quicker than now. I'm here to tell you something today, children. There was no loss of love between the Lord and Lazarus. 
The Lord did not delay his coming to Lazarus because he didn't love Lazarus. The Lord is not delaying his coming to your rescue and coming to your aid because he doesn't love you. That's not what's, that's not the purpose of the delay. He told his disciples, he said, no, he said, there is a, there is a plan at work here so that I'm going to be glorified in this. Hallelujah. If we're living the Christian life the way we're supposed to be living the Christian life, then we're supposed to be living it to glorify God. Am I telling Amen. the truth? Amen. The Word of God said, therefore glorify God in your mortal bodies. So if i got to go something in, through something in my body to bring glory to God, then so be it. Hallelujah. I've talked about it before. You know, the, the scripture tells us, I uh, beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Sometimes the only way God can show his power, sometimes the only way God can reveal his glory, Lisa, uh, we as believers have to go through some tough spots. Why? Because we got the faith to trust him. We got the faith to know that God don't bring us to the mouth of the lion's den. God don't bring us to the mouth of the fiery furnace except that he's got a plan for us to exit on the other side. Hallelujah! Unbelievers will die in the lion's den. Unbelievers will get burned up in the fiery furnace. But the children of God, hallelujah, we've got the love of God. We've got God's care wrapped around us. So yeah, we've got to go through a lot of the same garbage other people have to go through. We're not immune. The Bible said it rains on the just and the unjust. It rains on the wicked and the good. It, you know, when it rains, everybody gets wet. Everybody, Lisa, bound to have issues with their memory at some point in their life. As you get older, it happens to the best of us. Johnny, as we get older, our eyes dim. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean you're going to have 20-20 vision at 106 years old. No. As you get older, all of us start to have a little trouble hearing. All of us start to creak and crack when we sit down and when we stand up. Of course, me, I sit down and stand up and it sounds like I'm making popcorn. Are those they? Oh, well, there's some anywhere. Amen. <laughs> There's no loss of love because God is not immediately and quickly coming to our rescue. No, that's not the issue. The issue is not that there's a love loss. The issue is that God has a plan. Are you committed to letting God glorify himself through you? Hallelujah. Are you committed to to letting God glorify himself through you. I don't know how many years I prayed, Lord, oh, hallelujah. See, I can see. <laughs> the word of God tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, listen, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Why are we going, for God's sake we're going through these things. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that what? Loved us. Hallelujah. There's no love lost. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from what? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when these things come, Lisa, they don't have the power to separate us from the love of God. The issue is not a love loss. You're not going through what you're going through because God loves you any less. You're not going through what you're going through because God is mad at you. You're not going through what you're going through because God is angry with you. You are not going through what you're going through because God is judging you or condemning you or criticizing you or even chastising you. You're going through what you're going through because God has a greater plan. He has a greater purpose. He could come more quickly. You might translate that as he loves me more if he comes more quickly. But he's got a bigger plan. And believe me, when he reveals his big plan, you're going to know he loves you. When God brought me out of the hospital in 2000 after doctors had given me up for dead and told my family I had 24 hours to live, I've got news for you. I knew the Lord loved me. Hallelujah. My grandmother cried at the Thanksgiving table that year as I sat there enjoying my turkey and my cranberries and my stuffing. And my grandmother built wept over her food and she said CJ I have seen many miracles I've been in the Pentecostal church for over half a century I've seen many miracles but I have never seen one like God gave you she said I have, that is the most powerful wonderful incredible miracle I've ever seen she said God literally just brought you back from the dead she said, my God, you were down to 135 pounds. You were a skeleton, just skin wrapped over bone. And God brought you from the worst possible place. And he restored you. She said, and here you are. She said, I never dreamed in a million years you'd be sitting at this table having Thanksgiving dinner with us this year. You know what's funny? My family... A lot of my family, they were convinced that God was judging me. Because after all, I preach an affirming message to all these strange and perverted people. They were convinced that what was happening was the judgment of God. They were convinced that what was happening was God's wrath coming down upon my head. But guess what? The Lord waited until the last possible minute and then he stepped in and he rescued me and he restored me and he healed me. And guess what that said to my family? I love this boy. And I'm fine with what he's doing because I want him to keep doing it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give God the glory. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm fine with what he's doing. That's why I want him to keep on doing it. So Paul said, none of these things can separate us from the love of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, Paul writes, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes, above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Meaning literally, he was floating around in the, in the sea for a night and a day on an old piece of wood, <laughs> part of the ship he had been on. <clears throat> in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, 
Not everybody in the church is a Christian any more than everything in a barn is a cow. <laughs> in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So Paul lists all these horrific experiences, all these terrible times he's had to go through. I'm going to tell you something. If people going through bad times and experience bad things is the manifestation of a loss of love between God and them, then God must have hated Paul's guts. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Uh -huh. I'm telling you, the Lord must not have liked Paul at all. He must have had no use for Paul in the world. Because look at all. My God, that man's entire life in ministry, Lisa, was one struggle, one trial after another. Boy, I got news for you. I kind of understand that. <laughs> I do. I hate to say it. I kind of understand that. But Paul said, in spite of all these other things, he says, I still had my ministry to worry about. I still had folk in the church I was concerned about. So I had all this stuff going on outside, had all this sickness, had all these trials, had all these shipwrecks, had all this stuff, and I still had what was inside the ministry, the work of God, the people of God to worry about. I understand what Paul was talking about. But the same man who wrote about all these trials, is the same man who in Romans chapter 8 said, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The same guy who experienced all these. So guess what, honey? Those things didn't happen to Paul because of a love loss. Things are not happening to you today because there's a love loss. Don't you let the enemy convince you. Don't you let the enemy torment you that what you're going through, the hardship, the trial, the sickness, the disease, whatever you're experiencing, don't you let the devil tell you those things are in your life because of a loss of love. Because, honey, there is no loss of love. Hallelujah. John chapter 11, going back to our primary uh, passage today, but reading down the chapter a little bit, 10 uh, verses 20 and 21, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met with him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. What was she saying? She would say, Lord, I thought you loved Lazarus. What prevented you from coming more quickly? I thought you and Lazarus loved one another. What, what took you so long to get here? If you would gotten here sooner, this wouldn't have happened. Honey, you're forgetting who Jesus is. You're forgetting that uh, he don't see things from your perspective. You see Lazarus is dead. He sees Lazarus is napping. Hello now. Right. Hallelujah. You think this situation is finished, it's over, it's complete. You think that Lazarus is beyond hope, but you forgot that you're looking into the face of hope. Hallelujah. The minute Jesus comes on the scene, hope exists. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how hopeless things may seem. It doesn't matter how far gone your situation may appear. Once Jesus gets there, hope has arrived. Glory to God. Amen. Then further down the chapter, listen in John 11, verses 33 through 36. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, Lazarus' sister, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her 
He groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. The smallest verse in the Bible follows. John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. I've heard more sermons trying to tell me why Jesus wept. I've heard more explanations as to why Jesus wept. Jesus wept because of their lack of faith. Jesus wept because they didn't trust him. They didn't believe him. But then read verse 35. If you believe God had anything to do with the penning of the scriptures, then read verse 35. Look at what it says. Then said the Jews, listen, <laughs> behold how he loved him. Remember I told you at the start of this message, isn't it funny that there's such an emphasis on the love the Lord had, not only for Lazarus, but also for Mary and Martha. Now Jesus weeps, and the people around him interpret his, his weeping as emblemic or symbolic of his love for Lazarus. There was no loss of love. The Lord wasn't delayed in coming. He didn't put off coming right away because he didn't love Lazarus. No, he still loved Lazarus. He still cared about Mary. He still cared about Martha. But he had a bigger plan. He had a bigger purpose at work. He had a miracle that he wanted to perform that was going to blow people's minds. Not only was he going to raise a dead man from the grave, but he was going to raise a dead man who had been dead for days. There was no chance in the world, Tommy, that they were going to say, well, maybe he just went into a coma and, and, and then he just woke up from his coma. There was no chance that was going to happen. You know how many days a human being can exist without food? Several. You know how many days a person can live without water? Three. How long was Lazarus in the grave? Four. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's He's going to make sure, Johnny, that nobody can try to put another explanation on this. He's going to make sure, oh, I'm going to tell you right now, when I come out of the hospital in 2000, my doctor told me, he said, Charles, I can't even tell you what to expect from this day forward. I have never in all my years of practicing medicine, this is what my doctor said, folks, I have never seen anyone survive what you just came through. I have never, ever seen anybody survive what you just came through. See, Johnny, God wanted to make sure he got the glory. He wanted to make sure that no doctor, no scientist could turn around and say, well, maybe just this happened. Maybe just that happened. Because I'm going to tell you, people love to do that. When God performs miracles, people love to just say, well, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. Yeah, and maybe the sun's the moon and the moon is the sun. <laughs> Give me a break. Lazarus was in the grave four days. They said, Lord, surely by now he stinks. He's been in that grave so long. You know what? He was in that grave long enough, Tommy, that even if he had been in a coma and suddenly woke up, he'd have been dead by the time they took the lid off of that tomb because he had had no access to water for four days. Oh, I'm going to tell you, God knows how to make sure your miracle counts as a miracle. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you today, children, what you're going through, what we're going through, what I'm going through. <laughs> it's not because God doesn't love you. It's not because he's changed his mind about you. It's not because he's angry with you or he's mad at you. There is no loss of love. He has a plan. Can you trust him? Can you believe him? Can you understand that when he gets there, he'll get there. And whenever he arrives, 
it'll be right on time. Hallelujah. There's no loss of love. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.